Steven's name gets announced, the music plays, you bound out on stage, and the place just erupts. And you're sort of out over your skis, you're basically stretching the truth, you're committing things in real time that don't exist. If you have used any piece of computing over the last 20 years, you have used or been angry at this man's work. Slack and all of these are pretty much optimized towards, I'm going to say the thing that is going to get the most reactions right away. I don't write immediately when I have an idea. Where do you see the world headed over the next couple of years? This place is screwed up as you might think it is, it's worse. Do you think like we are kind of at the tail end of the smartphone innovation cycle? I used to be the person sending him random emails from time to time. And I was a low level minion. Steven was running, I think like 20,000 people. It was super difficult. It was super painful. And it was a huge change for a lot of people. The one, the only, Steven Sinowski. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special episode. Uh, if you have listened to our show in any one of its incarnations, you have seen this person before. If you've been on tech Twitter, or if you have used any piece of computing over the last 20 years, you have used or been angry at this man's work. Uh, he has <laughs> he has run Office. He has run Windows. He's not afraid to express his opinions on uh, some of the biggest tech trends out there today. And he looks good on camera. Uh, the one, the only... Steven Sinowski. Steven! Woo! Woo! <laughs> wow, there was an introduction, and it only had a couple of minor insults in it. Good job. Uh, oh, well, it's great to be here, guys. I'm super excited, and I'm excited for your show, and excited to join in your ever-growing audience. Well, we're just getting started on the insult, so we will see. And um, so I think, just to back up a little, our show, the reason why we do this show, we you know, came to tech industry and to Silicon Valley now. And when we first started our journey, we first, our first jobs were at Microsoft, and we saw ourselves as complete outsiders to the ecosystem. Like, you know, we kind of thought of ourselves as like, we don't really belong here, we don't really know how to break into this. Um, and at that time, you know, Microsoft gave us a lot with respect to just mentorship, knowledge, uh, and just like the, the courage and the ability to break into it. And I think you played a really big role and we'll get to it. But our show is all about, you know, us being outsiders coming into the inside. And we suspect that a lot of people watching, listening to this show are similar to us and whatever that means for them. You know, it could be a different industry, different career path, all of that. But breaking in from being an outsider to insider is like our core theme. And for us, you know, for both Sriram and me, I think you are kind of an embodiment mm -hmm. of that because we've just learned so much through your works, through, you know, your products. Uh, we never worked together directly at Microsoft, but we learned a lot just watching you work. Um, and so it's just such a great privilege to be here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Steven knows me from our time at Microsoft, and I used to be the person sending him random emails from time to time. And I was a low-level minion, a level L61 minion, and you know, Steven was running, I think, like 20,000 people uh, at the time. But we want to get right into that. But I actually want to start off on something which I don't think anybody's asked you about before in um, public, but I think it's kind of like a real superpower and something I'm sort of mildly jealous of you for which is you have the skill to write incredibly long, articulate, thoughtful pieces, which is amazing in itself. And you know, and you've done some amazing piece of work over the years. Now, but what's actually even more unique, because there are a lot of great writers, but what I think makes you really special is you're able to kind of write really long f content in very, very short periods of time. And I've seen you write paragraphs and paragraphs in emails, in notes, uh, which, would take a regular human being hours or days to put together in a minute. So I am curious, right? Like, where did you learn to do that? How do you do that? How does somebody else do that? Well, I, I think, thank you. You know, often, <laughs> like, the, the, I get a lot of pushback and, and also negatives for not being able to be super, super concise. And I don't have that ability to do that as quickly as I would like. So I'm always sacrificing time to get an idea out there with time to get a short idea out there. Mm -hmm. But I, I also just struggle because I always just think there's so much around every topic. Like I don't, I just don't think things can get distilled down to the degree that most people would like to consume them. And I just really struggle with that. And I struggle with that when I read and I feel like the author was trying to squeeze it into a certain amount. Like I just read this wonderful book called Americana about the history of capital mm -hmm. across hundreds of years Great from book. the founding of the company country. And 
each chapter is amazing. And each chapter I felt was too short. And I, there were always more that I wanted to know. So I always think like that, yet I know that most people don't. And, but when it comes to writing, I really, I feel like I just, I stick to this sort of five paragraph essay format, except I do like five paragraphs for each paragraph. Hmm. And, but I, I generally try to have like an introduction and then three or four points and then a conclusion. And it's just that my three or four points don't take a paragraph. They take like five or 10 paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And, but the other thing that I do think that, uh, you know, if I take what you said at face value about trying to do a good job in a lot of words, a lot of what I've always tried to do is I, I don't write immediately when I have an idea. Like I just, I'll, I'll walk around, I'll, you know, take like a three mile walk or I'll spend a day or two or I'll futz around and just not write it just yet. Cause I try to gather it in my head as much as possible before I start to write. And that goes for email too. Like, a lot of times in the old school email debates, like the biggest problem is somebody starts replying to themselves because they, <laughs> they said what they said and then they realized they didn't say what they said mm -hmm. and then they realized they didn't say what they wanted to say when they said it again. And so <laughs> what I tended to do was just wait like 15 minutes, but use that 15 minutes productively mm -hmm. in thinking about what you wanted to say. And then, you know, do the blasting it out thing and send it. Got and it. I do think that that's, in, in particular with messaging and with email, it's this first to respond thing that was always a problem. And so I wasn't always first, but I at least tried to, and which people always thought, oh, that's because you're writing so much. And it's like, well, I was trying to think about it too. Right, right. And, there... and that's sort of what happened with hardcore software, mm -hmm. you know, where like, I thought about it for years, like eight years, then I wrote it, and but then bringing it in real time through Substack, I ended up literally writing twice as much as I had as a draft, Yeah, which was kind of weird. Where do you think you learned to do that? Was something you'd already done, you, you always did when you were at Cornell and as a student, was sort of a skill picked up in sort of the, you know, the early battlefields of Microsoft? Where did this come from? Well, I think it, there are three places, and I know that's weird, but there are three moments that I really learned. One, I just had this writing teacher in ninth grade, Mrs. Yeah. Nardi, and she was the five paragraph essay person in my life, and we had to write like something every week with her. And she was like English teacher from Central Casting. Like you would have thought she was an English teacher on The Simpsons. <laughs> Everything that she did was exactly what you would expect. And she was great. And I remember years later, I wrote her a, a letter, like a paper letter, mm -hmm. thanking her because she was really important to me. Then there was my freshman year in college, which was sort of a continuation of ninth grade, but it was super interesting in terms of the history of computing because there, the, my freshman year, this is sort of a Gen X thing, you know, like we're the first generation that, the last generation to use a typewriter and the first generation to use a computer. Mm -hmm. But in the fall of 1983, we were the last generation to use a typewriter and the first to use a computer in college, like that fall semester. Right. And in fact, like what happened to me was I got picked into a class that was this, the testing class for should we use a computer for writing? Mm -hmm. And it got became it. this whole controversy on campus at the time because the English department was really worried everybody would become a bad writer. And everybody else was like, well, we want to use like a computer, but there weren't computers on campus yet because actually the Macintosh would come out the following semester in January. So only a few people, like I had a CPM Osborne luggable computer and I was the only one in the whole dorm with a computer and everybody else, you could use a mainframe like to word process at the time. And so, but our class was like really focused on this iterative drafting process because we the computers we used were Xerox 820 word processing PC computers like mm -hmm. they they were portrait oriented you know monitors right. they 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 only feature of word processing they did were revisions like you still had to press return at the end mm -hmm. of every line like mm -hmm. a typewriter all sorts of weird <laughs> stuff you had eight inch floppies that I had to carry around campus the whole time <laughs> and and then the output was a dot matrix printer but because those were in short supply, 
you sort of had to word process before you got to the word processor. Mm. Like right. there were more students than there were word processors. And so you, you ended up having to use a computer, but sort of treating it like a slightly better typewriter. Got it. And the teachers at the time made you turn in rough drafts like in the middle based on because they were testing out whether the computer was helping. So you had to turn in your draft to prove to them that you were making progress. Got it. But that iterative process was really important. And then the third place was exactly what you would expect, which is literally, you know, I get out of graduate school and I'm airdropped into the Microsoft environment which at the time was this avant-garde, email-centric environment. And even at a research university, we did not do the volume of email mm -hmm. and the time. And that was like a Bill thing. Mm -hmm. Like Bill was, because he, he basically just sat in his office and sent email to people. And he'd go to the Xenex terminal and he'd look to see who was logged on and who wasn't, because we you could do that. And not only who was logged on, but who was typing at that moment, you wow. could see on the TTY <laughs> command. And like, and and everything was just done that way as a culture right and and you it, in you know for better or worse like you you know you read about companies that are like you have to stand up in front of a room and really shine or you have to do great powerpoint decks or a bank where you have to if you don't do a good spreadsheet you're doomed well mm -hmm. the microsoft culture was email mm -hmm. yep. and you were either varsity email or you weren't yeah yep. but like you that was the Darwinian element of the company was, could you do email? And it wasn't just, you know, and you also had to do it in this weird, old, the old school Xenix, Unix mail command, which, you know, you had to pipe into VI and edit that way and do all that, you know, it was all that inline reply kind of semantic yeah, stuff. Yeah, But you just had to get very, very good at it. And the sort of the time to market was really key. Because right. everything was just, the, it was just, we treated email as though it were messaging. Right. Oh, God. And, and, you know, like if you missed one reply all, you know, you, you couldn't thread your reply in there correctly. <laughs> and so you just had to, you just had to, that was survival of the fittest. Good or bad, that's what it was. You know, I have a theory, which is, uh, as somebody who kind of grew up in that Microsoft email environment, that messaging apps like, say, Slack or Discord are actually not an upgrade for certain forms of intellectual discourse. Because what I see is, and I work in a firm and I deal with a lot of companies who use Slack full time, is that with chat, you tend towards having more real time, which is good, but shorter, maybe less thought out communication. And the incentive structure is, hey, I need to get in there. I need to get some emoji responses. I need to kind of keep up with what is going. And there was something about uh, the mode of creating an email, which sometimes lends itself to like writing a few paragraphs, having to construct a few thoughts, which does not seem to happen with the same frequency as Slack and But also for Steve's. near instant gratification in the form of a response. I think uh, yeah. Slack and all of these are pretty much optimized towards, I'm going to say the thing that is going to get the most reactions right away. Uh, as opposed to, I want to say the thing that is a well-constructed thought or, or, you know, I've actually had time to like think about it kind of thing. Yeah, certainly, you know, the difference is, is huge and it's, it's a cultural difference, but it's also a generational difference. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we were very focused on making ar on arguments, like it was, it was a fight. And so, you know, we did all sorts of stuff like, you know, we, we only had ASCII, like it wasn't, there was no emoji, there was, you know, we had smiley faces, of course, and stuff, mm -hmm. but we didn't really use those all that much. Mm -hmm. It was... We used a lot of, you know, asterisks as bullets and mm -hmm. numbered lists and and then lots of, um, you know, greater than signs for inserting replies and stuff like that. And it was very much like, here's a question or an assertion. Here's five reasons for a reply that don't work. And then everybody's inserting into there. That one's not going to work. That one's going to work. And it was very much like a brainstorming debate, mm -hmm. you know, but overlaid with the org chart because, you know, the, the minute that Bill or Steve Ballmer or somebody came in, it was like, boom, nuclear bomb. And then everybody, you know, different people would bounce. Because the, the, the org chart sort of plays into who responded when and all this. Other, and all yeah. of those hidden cultural norms of, like, who was CC'd, who was BCC Back then, you know, the, the ordering of the two line mattered and, you know, all of this <laughs> stuff. And then we started getting into attachments once that became a thing. And. Then people were attaching Word documents as memos, you know, 
because that made it like you were even thinking more. But it was always the key thing about Microsoft was it was a culture of long form writing. Mm -hmm. Like this all, all of this got formed before the company even owns PowerPoint. So like it only had a word processor and a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And so it was, and Bill was a, always was still is a voracious reader. And so that really became the, the culture and it just played into everything about how all the decisions were made and, and everything. So you read about Amazon and 10 page memos and the first 15 minutes of meetings. We had all of those memos and all of those things, but you just had to be ready all the time because it could happen on Sunday afternoon. It could happen on Friday night. It was just always like that. And people would do off sites and they would write memos after mm -hmm. them. And so that led to a very rich history or a narrative that you could tap into to understand what really happened at the time. Mm -hmm. You've had such a long and storied career at Microsoft, but you know, I think I want to sort of focus on three things. You know, one is your time working with Bill. Uh, and um, because I think you were the catalyst for many things, including Microsoft's foray into the internet, obviously time at Office, and then into Windows a little bit. But I want to kind of start with your time at, with Bill, because you wrote the memo, uh, I think, after a trip to Cornell. And if I remember, you have this great story about trying to figure out how to even get internet connectivity in Microsoft. Could you maybe kind of paint the picture of what the internet was like as an entity and what it meant to pull that into Microsoft as something to focus on back then? Sure. Well, you know, obviously there's a long version of all of this, but the, the most interesting thing was that you have to remember that Microsoft was the most leading edge company when it came to connectivity and the use of digital tools. Maybe you could look at a Sun Microsystems, which mm -hmm. was doing the same kind of culture, but on a Unix workstation level. But literally, we were all on email all the time. We all had these elaborate productivity tools. We had laptops. We had connectivity from home, all through dial-up modems and all that kind of stuff. And then in, in early 1994, you know, so about in, in February of 1994, I go on this recruiting trip to Cornell, my alma mater, and I'd gone every year. So I had seen this continuity. And so, and I would always go to the computer place. Like, you know, computers used to only be in one place on campus. And you would go there and you would sign in and get time at one of the terminals, which by then were Macs. And, and so I get there and like, it's just completely different. Like people would show up with a floppy disk. Mm -hmm. They would pop the floppy in and they were connecting to this sort of portal. Mm -hmm. which the Cornell mascot is a bear, like Misha the bear from the Soviet Olympics, <laughs> and although obviously earlier. But they popped this in, and it was called Bear Access. Mm. And Bear Access, like you clicked on these, you know, like sort of six or eight buttons. Like one was to look at this online information portal called CU Info, which I, I had, for a brief time, worked on, and it was an IBM mainframe information system, and we had kiosks all over campus on terminals mm -hmm. but they had built a front end for for the mac and so you could look up you know when the class schedules were when exam schedules mm -hmm. were the weather you know movies stuff like that and then there was like use the university of minnesota gopher site mm. <laughs> and that was like some weird app that looked like <laughs> navigating folders mm -hmm. except the folders were you know it sort of was basically like yahoo yeah like here's right. a folder called physics and then here's the courses being taught here's mm -hmm. physics reference materials here's the lab hours and then you click on that it would be a list of all the courses and then eventually you'd get to like either a picture or like a, a text file mm -hmm. to read and then there was like email and you'd click on that and it would launch like eudora and then you would put your disk in you and configure it and download your mail onto your disk because Cornell didn't want to store your mail very long mm -hmm. because they didn't have servers space. And then you would answer your mail and then you would take out your disk and your mail would be on your disk. Your, all your mail would be on this one, <laughs> one point whatever megabyte disk. Yeah. And, and, you know, there, and then there was like this one other one called www. And, you know, you clicked on it. And you got this program at the time called Cello, which was a browser written by the Cornell Law School. Mm -hmm. huh. And it was this HTML browser. 
And okay. they also had mosaic stuff, but of course this cello was, they were very proud of cello mm -hmm. and they ran it. And, and all of this was happening on Macintosh. So now mm -hmm. I'm the Microsoft recruiter and I love Mac. Like I programmed for Mac early in at my years at Cornell, right when it came out. I'm an original Mac person. Most everyone who worked on what became Office was hired to write on Mac software because that was the huge business for Microsoft right. at the time. Right. But, but like there were no PCs like on campus anywhere. Yeah. And that's because of the Apple evangelism effort headed by a guy named Dan Lewin, who was later at Microsoft to just seed the campuses with Macintosh. And they did that at, at Cornell, at Brown, at Stanford, at Cal Berkeley, uh, UPenn, at Dartmouth, a bunch of schools. And we knew this because we hired in apps, we hired those people to come work on, <laughs> on a board in Excel for the Mac. But I'm now Bill's technical assistant. No idea what that really means yet. I'm kind of new to the job. I'm three months into the job. Like it's a weird job. Only a couple other people have done it before and totally different. But whatever. I'm just like, okay, this is this must be bad because it's only on Mac. You know, Windows is in the middle of sort of it finished Windows 3.1 and 3.11. Windows 95 is under development. It's already super late. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still codenamed the Chicago. There's nothing. And so I'm like, so I write this whole thing up. Like I spend like, oh, and I'm also trapped in the snow. I can't leave the city because mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. flights are all canceled, which is a thing that happened about every other year on this recruiting trip. <laughs> And so I like basically make some kid who works at the mm. facility, which is empty because there's no, you know, it's literally a huge blizzard. And I just torture him for hours on end to show me all the stuff, explain it all to me. And I got lucky because he kind of wanted an internship. Mm. And so it was sort of like a good <laughs> deal. And so I just write this whole thing down. Like, and, I, and this magazine had just started becoming cool called Wired. So I write this memo that says Cornell is Wired. And I'm, you know, that's the pun at the time. Wired uh -huh. means plugged in. It's internet or whatever. Wired, not tired. Wired, not tired. <laughs> oh my and, God. and I send it off to a couple people, in particular, Brad Silverberg, who was running Windows, and, um, and Bill. And Brad immediately says, hey, this guy, John Ludwig, is looking into this stuff. And John was, in, was like the networking person in Windows, and he was transitioning to become, or he is, was head of Chicago when it was just getting started. And John immediately says, oh, there's this other guy on the Windows NT team, which at the time, these were two like basically warring teams at Windows. <laughs> uh, you can think of it as the 16-bit Windows team and the 32-bit Windows team. Mm -hmm. So the grown-up 32-bit Windows team made up of all these adults hired from digital equipment or anything. Dave Cutler, Mark Lukowski, that oh, whole crew. And the guy in charge of networking is Dave Thompson, who was a fellow Cornell graduate a few years before me, but oh, okay. also part of the digital equipment mafia and Got stuff. It. He says, oh, there's this annoying guy working on networking, and I asked him to go make this TCP IP thing go away. And so <laughs> that's this guy named Jay Allard. Okay. And so many people have heard that name because he later went on to be a founding member of the Xbox, Xbox team. team. But at the time, he was a new hire who had just come from Boston University, where he worked as in the IT group of the computer science department or something like that. And he was hired literally to just solve what was referred to as Steve Ballmer's TCP IP problem. And the TCP IP <laughs> problem was that all of the big corporate accounts, which we were just in the earliest days of becoming an enterprise company, were clamoring to switch from what was called XNS networking which is the old Xerox networking standard, to CTCP IP. And Steve had no idea what it is, and which is interesting because he had run Landman, which was Microsoft's not successful foray into enterprise networking right. before heading up Windows. Mm -hmm. And then the, at the time, by 94, the sales team. And he was like, I need this TCP IP problem, solve it. Whatever it is, just solve it. And so Jay literally had like something like TCP IP guy on his business card. And so I go over to his office, and of course we're just immediately buddies he's got wearing puma clydes mm. i'm wearing puma clydes we're from the northeast we hit it off and of and so it turns out that tcp ip was sort of the first thing that the company had to wrap its head around as not being a thing that you make go away but a thing that you completely have to pivot around because if you don't do tcp ip mm -hmm. you're not in the internet game because right. the internet it, there's no internet is not transport independent 
Right. Now, Everything I, about it was based on TCP IP, TCP. which was not at all how we thought about networking. Yeah. And the reason that Microsoft didn't think about networking that way was because we were coming from behind against this company called Novell, but it invented like office networking. And so Novell, of course, the person who was CEO at the time later went on to be the CEO of Google, Google. Eric Schmidt. But Novell was pivoting to TCP IP, but our comp competitive battle with Novell was, oh, we'll just build Windows NT and Windows Chicago to be agnostic about networking protocol. And so we'll build this nice OSI layered architecture where we don't really care and we'll commoditize the protocol. Commoditizing your compliments, I think, is the phrase you're looking for. Uh, yeah. Oh, Mr. Business School. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and so that was our strategy to just make TCVIP one of many. Mm -hmm. And Jay, like in his office, was like, that's just stupid. That's not going to work. It's only TCVIP. It's the only one that's going to win. And he was technically right. Like nothing else was going to scale mm -hmm. and nothing else was going to really work. So we hit it off and we have to just start. And so, but the funny thing is, Jay's view is then, but all the stuff on top of TCVIP, that's just, there are going to be a million of these things. So do you see the same Again, to monetize your compliments. So he's like, oh, we want to have RTCP IP and then use WinSockets. And then there'll be like 100 browsers and 100 gophers and 100 this, 100 that. And I'm like, OK, but I think this browser one mm -hmm. is like really important, which is exactly what the Windows graphical user interface side of the group or Brad Silverberg and team started to think. And so they started down a path of like, maybe we should figure out a browser really quick. And so within three weeks of of that um that trapped in the snow i get back jay had already written his memo which was equally impactful or more so mm -hmm. called um the next killer application windows the mm -hmm. next killer application on the internet mm -hmm. he was already into it for a few months so he had made a whole argument about the growth of the internet and so in hardcore software i reproduce some of those elements and have yeah. a copy of the memo but like yeah. You know, these little mini exponential yeah. curves of mm -hmm. like, there's 20 sites on the internet. Now there's 60 sites on the internet. And, you know, this is all happening right now. So I just get back to the office finally after a very long journey back. I'm talking, I talk to Jay. I'm like, okay, first things first, as much as Microsoft's a writing culture, the next thing that happens after writing is an offsite. And Bill just loves, loves offsites. So I'm like new to my job as technical assistant. I'm like, Bill, we're having an offsite. He's like, ooh, I love offsites. What this one's going to be about? I'm like, that memo I wrote about Cornell, it's this internet thing. He's like, that? And he, you know, he goes, that? Ah. And, and so, like, we, we, so we're now literally four weeks from, like, that snowstorm. Yeah. The memos are flying around the company. I get everybody to go to this offsite at the Shumway Mansion in Kirkland, Washington. And we were just like, okay, literally, what the F are we going to do about the internet? And Jay's memo already had this sort of embrace and extend thing. Bill latched on to that. But the most important moment of that whole offsite was in that interim three or four weeks, I just did nonstop demos of the internet. Imagine that, a demo of the internet. Like, what does that even mean? How do you demo the internet? Mm -hmm. Well, you drag someone in your office. I at first had to get connected. So I like, I call up Dave Lineweber, who runs the network at, at my, ran the network at Microsoft, and he was like an original hire from the early 80s, you know, like, mm -hmm. and I'm like, Dave, I need to get on the internet. He's like, no, you don't. We don't allow that. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, did you ever notice how you get your mail only like two times a day? That's because we dial up, down, download all the mail, and then disconnect from the internet. <laughs> and that was because Gordon Lett, when the original DOS yep. programmer guy, was like, it's insecure. We're not doing that. And Gordon was hardcore about not being on the internet. Now, of course, by, by the 90s, we were connected all the time. But for many, up until like probably 92, we were part-time internet. And Dave was like, look, the only way you could be on the internet is if like I run this cable from like the internet hmm. into your office and it's like red. And this red cable, nothing else can connect to it ever. And you can't put two network cables in that computer because the internet will blow up and Microsoft will collapse. And so it turns out, Jay also had one of those cables. 
And outside of, actually, it was technically outside of this guy named David Treadwell's office, who mm -hmm. you guys remember from yeah. who's, who's now at David, Amazon. He's on the S team at Amazon now. Mm -hmm. yeah. David, um, who was hired the same summer as me out of Princeton, he was building, he and Henry Sanders, a classmate of, of one year of different, my old boss at Cornell mm -hmm. when I was a terminal operator. Henry and Dave were the developers writing Microsoft's TCP IP stack and utilities. Right, right. They had a, a tower Dell server outside their office with this red cable coming down from the roof that was ftp.microsoft.com. And they were running Microsoft's first internet facing presence mm -hmm. like in, on unreleased Windows NT stuff in front of their office. So I now had the other one of those at the company. And and so like, I'm like doing what you could do on the internet in March of 1994, which is download Mosaic, mm -hmm. look at like 50 different websites like mtv.com. Um, the one that I showed people a lot was um, uh, uh, novell.com because they had a site with the how to use network books as the homepage. Mm -hmm. But Adam Curry's mtv.com, that got the popular interest from people. There was like a, the of course there was the, um, the webcam for looking at the Coke machine, which was at CMU or wherever that was. There was the Lily Hammer Olympics were going on, and they had a. Oh, and I when I say webcam, it was like 120 by 160 black and white, five frames per second, you know, quick cam. They had one of those at the Lily Hammer closing ceremony, you know, basically still images. And so I would show that to anyone I could. Like all these famous people were always coming to see Bill. I would always grab them and like famous movie directors, mm -hmm. people who ran telephone companies, all these people. And to a person, they all thought it was the stupidest thing they ever saw. <laughs> like the AT&T people were the best because they literally was all running on their wires mm -hmm. and they had very elaborate arguments for why it wasn't going to work and right. scale. Then like another guy who used to work at Microsoft who had started, it, oh, let's just call it a famous music streaming company uh -huh. showed up and said, oh, who owns it? That was like a very popular question. Who owns all of this internet wire? That's a very real anecdote right there. Uh, it's super, very progressive, very real anecdote. Very real. Um, and, and I'm like, I don't really care. It works. Like, it's super cool. And the argument was it can't work because no one owns it. And so yeah. the early seeds of why open source was such a problem for Microsoft. Yeah. And so I'm showing demos to everybody. Then we get to the offsite. Bill, Bill, and of course, I did the demo for Bill, for Nathan Merville, you know, everybody. Someone like Brad Silverberg, of course, he had the internet in the, in the early days when he was in graduate school, just like everybody did. Mm -hmm. But it, it morphed into this whole new thing very, very quickly. So we show everybody the internet. And I'm like, Bill, this is the biggest thing in the history of big things. I didn't say those words. I just said, here's the deal, Bill. Everything we're doing that you call information at your fingertips already exists on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And his big demo was like hypertext, yeah. which everybody knows is an old idea. Right. Andy Van Dam, the 1960s. Ted Nelson, uh, Zanadu, Zanadu, all of that. Yeah. Right. But, and Andy Van Dam, a great friend of Microsoft's, you know, long time uh, part of the technical advisory board. And so, uh, but I'm like, Bill, it exists and it's all right here. And I can like type an HTML page and make it work. Yeah. So we have to have an editor for HTML. We have to have a server for mm -hmm. HTML. You know, this go for one looks super interesting. There are these things that like that do searching that are kind of interesting at the time. There was just ways, but that was a big part of the information. And I'm like, and so Bill, this is it. And so the first thing he does is present like a slide. Now, this is the, the way that legends are born. Like, I, of course, made the slide because that's how offsites work. But Bill presented it. So as far as I'm concerned, it was him saying it. And that's all that mattered, which was make no mistake. Like, we're betting on the Internet as a huge transformation for the company. And so nobody needs to spend time evaluating the Internet, developing a view if the Internet's going to be important or anything like that. We're here at the offsite today, which, by the way, is April 3rd. Um, 1994, which anybody who knows corporate history, the same day that Netscape was incorporated. Mm. And so Bill like sends everybody out. And so we have like a bunch of breakouts. Like, what are we going to do for this thing we were developing for Windows 95 Chicago that was an online service? Like, does that mean the World Garden AOL thing that it was going after goes away? How much do we put in Windows 95? Like, do we put 
Gopher, Waze, browser, HTML, TCP IP, what do we put in? What does the office team do if all these documents are going to be like in HTML? Like, for example, somebody had already written using Visual Basic a way to convert PowerPoint slides into web pages. Hmm. And and like you could recognize them on super old like archive.org pages right. because they look like unscalable GIFs with um, These, forward and backward I don't, buttons yeah, at the bottom. This. And and that was like the first PowerPoint add-in for making HTML, which they showed me, like at the Pizza Hut, like when I when I was down there visiting them, and so we just got going. And then yeah. Bill wrote another memo. I wrote lots of memos, but it was just the best part about all of this. And the really big lesson for a corporation was we had a point of view that the internet was extremely important, and whatever you did had to value the internet mm -hmm. as a core aspect of the strategy. And then it was not prescriptive after that. So it leads to this sort of chaos and lack of like, OK, we have the one answer. Like we had 20 ways to create HTML. We had multiple ways to create HTTP extensions and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But we had all of them. And, and I think that's the sort of the really big lesson in how to execute a strategy most people think that you you come in and then you become like this like router for the whole company and everything goes through you and mm -hmm. everything is edited by you and touched by you but really like for example like the salesforce had to go and use the web to go distribute sales materials right and steve Ballmer just said we're doing it with the web and you know at the time all they did was every month they use Microsoft's help tool, which is the tool that looked like hypertext that was in the information of readers. And with a staff of like 20 people, they converted Word documents to help files. They put them onto a CD-ROM and then used DHL to send the CD-ROMs to all of the subsidiaries, like 100 subsidiaries around the world, who would then put them on CD carousels and serve them out to the company. And that all took like a month. So by the time they were done, it was the next months was already arriving. <laughs> <laughs> so I met with that person and I said, look, I don't know what your job is. I have no idea how to run a sales force. I understand WinHelp and I understand HTML and they're the same, except one of them works on the internet and that's our strategy. <laughs> uh, first of all, there's so much to unpack over there. One, you know, a lot of what you're saying kind of makes me think about the reaction to folks looking at, say, crypto or some new technology for the very first time. I've been dragging people, maybe not in my office, but definitely showing demos and sometimes a similar reaction. But your narrative is so interesting because there is a meme that Microsoft resisted the internet, that Microsoft in the 90s was all about, hey, we want to fight the internet because our moat was in desktop software and the internet is a fundamental threat to a business model. Now, there are shades of truth, but I think what I love about your memo and Jay's memo, which either you write about, it's also on my site, cmk.com, and what Bill did is, Microsoft actually really embraced the internet in a different way. Uh, and it's not exactly them being like, hey, we want to destroy all things HTTP. Yeah, I, I mean, like the thing that was so interesting about it, that, that moment in time, you have to keep in mind, there's really two forces at play. Mm -hmm. There's the, the commercial software space, and that included like networking software and client server, which is an old architecture for developing like line of business applications. Like, but there's also the world of like telecom, mm -hmm. and the world of telecom hated the internet from the beginning. And it's not just that they hated the, they hated like packet switching, they hated open networks, and so people at the time thought Microsoft was more aligned, like people meaning industry analysts, Wall Street and stuff, were more aligned with telcos than we were with the computing world. And part of the reason was, at the time this is all going on, Microsoft is building an America Online competitor, which was clearly aligned with the world of telco. Mm -hmm. Even at a technical level, like it was using X25 and mm -hmm. X whatever the other one is for, um, for, for packet switching. Like for, I mean, for connection-based connectivity. And, and so that was part of the telcos. All the telcos were building their own private dial-up networks too. And Microsoft was working with Time Warner to build like a cable television closed network. Mm -hmm. And huge amounts of energy went into that. And it was very, very clear, even to us then, that the internet was going to upend that whole notion. Because all you had to do is look, even though there were only 200 sites on the internet, period, 200 worldwide websites, 
Yep. The fact that like they just could pop up and that you know David Treadwell in his office could start ftp.microsoft.com and get 60,000 people downloading DOS in the first 12 hours, you know, it shows it that the walled garden wasn't really going to work even if we really really wanted it to. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't going to work. Right. And so it, but it's, it was hard to escape the perception from the outside world that Microsoft would, of course, be aligned with closed proprietary world because and there was no open source at the time. And that's really important. There was open systems, mm -hmm. which is different than open source. And open systems was just like the five Unix people trying to agree on like a windowing system, which is now like 35 years later and they still have it. You know, they have it. If you have, still today, if I have to set up X on a laptop, it's like I'm now Googling for what is the config file. Yeah. Now, there's actually a big strong parallel to all things crypto because one of the things I believe and a lot of folks in crypto believe is that open systems, open connectivity, uh, just openness in general tends to win out in the long run. It harnesses kind of the forces of the internet. It harnesses uh, creativity. There is a parallel there because even back then, I think one of the reasons push failed as a technology, one of the reasons AOL is not a trillion dollar company today is that openness won over uh, proprietary wall guard and closed systems. Yeah, I think of not understanding open and finding a definition that worked for Microsoft was probably one of our three big corporate failings in that whole, mm -hmm. in the arc of hardcore software. But it's very, very subtle. And it, it's not exactly, you, you, you can't peg it exactly on the religion of open versus closed because what what really happened in the arc of openness was there was no openness. Then there was this amazing openness of the Windows PC. Because, of course, like I was just reading a 1984 article that came out, um, IBM losing to clones. And it was the mm -hmm. cover of Business Week magazine. And, and I was reading it because I have this whole collection of all the magazine covers from the mm -hmm. era. And one of the interesting things was that was an openness that undid the proprietary hardware standard that IBM was trying to have. In the meantime, Windows was open at the API level and at the OS level, but it was like sort of a copyrighted set of APIs that you weren't allowed to copy. Mm -hmm. And so at every point in the narrative of open, there's open in a new way, but there's always a proprietary element because you have to build a business somehow. And you can't really build a business around just purely free if it's going to evolve. And then the real lesson for that came at the height of open source, basically Linux, which is Linux going to take over for Windows, whatever. And we're like, it's just not. Mm -hmm. Because I know we have a thousand people working on device drivers and there's just not enough people who are willing to devote that much energy for free to make device drivers work forever. Mm -hmm. But Google loved open source, mm -hmm. except Nothing they did was in the open. And they figured out, a, they hacked the open source model mm -hmm. by putting it all in a data center and never redistributing the software. Now, let me ask you a spicy question here. Um, that was uh, spicy. I was being spicy right then. Well, I just, I because, Google hacked the open source model. Come well, we, we're going to take up, uh, we're going to take up the habanero uh, or spice level. Um, um, by the way, I think we're going to have so many great segments from this video, including the part where you say, I love Max. And we're going to be like, uh, Steven Sinovsky loves Max. Uh, yeah, uh, put the, 1983 up there. But yeah. yeah, well, maybe not that part. Now, <laughs> because I think it's hard for people, you know, who are born baby, post 80s or 90s, really to understand how dominant Microsoft was in that era. And to this day, I run into people who are angry with Microsoft for the 90s, right? For what happened at Netscape, uh, Embrace and Extend, uh, the Halloween files, uh, that whole, you know, kind of like era. era that Microsoft went through. I am curious, like looking back, are there things that you think Microsoft should have done differently? Was there any long-term damage that they've suffered as a brand uh, that actually mattered in any substantial way? I, uh, you know, it's sort of you're damned if you do, damned if you don't when you answer a question like that. Like if I say, oh, here are all these things I want to apologize for, you know, I don't know how sincere that's going to be. If I say, no, we didn't do anything wrong. Well, that sounds ridiculous mm -hmm. given that everybody says we did a bunch of stuff wrong. I, the thing is, is that at every era, there are dominant companies and people, they love the underdog 
and they for a short time they celebrate the winner and then they really really dislike the winner and the truth is it's very very hard to be liked when there's a giant antitrust trial going on like you're just you can't be the underdog in mm. the middle of an antitrust trial like yeah. it just doesn't that isn't right like the whole point of the antitrust <laughs> trial is to tear you down yeah. and to prove that you did something wrong and ultimately the things we did wrong and were convicted of doing wrong and then unconvicted and then agreed that we should change our business practices without agreeing that we did a whole lot wrong or whatever the you know they <laughs> may or may not have been kosher on the other hand it was a brand new business that didn't have a precedent and we grew into the monopoly that we had mm -hmm. like when like if you look at the actual like what we had to change and what was different or whatever there were really two big things one was how we licensed windows to oems okay well that was like a whole thing that didn't exist before yeah licensing software to people who made computers and we went from having no customers to having one customer with ibm to having two while our computers didn't weren't dominant yet and then one day we had like eight customers 50 customers and then that's all the computers except for macintosh if you define them as personal computers and so there was no doubt where our market position was but we grew into it and all those terms and conditions well they were old and they were what we did when we had no share mm -hmm. and now i know all the stories that people will tell about that but then you know the the other part of 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 that was just this like adding features to windows thing and you know like one of the features was a browser <laughs> the problem is i'll come back to our earlier conversation about tcp ip you know what another feature we added to windows was was tcp ip connectivity mm -hmm. and right. we didn't get sued over adding tcp ip to windows but you know few people remember but there were companies that made tcp ip and they charged $350 to put that on your computer. Mm -hmm. And if you if you didn't pay that, then you weren't connected to the internet. And 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 it was turns out if, if you ask uh, Treadwell or Henry Sanders, it's actually really, really hard to write good TCP IP. And so the, the free ones weren't great. Mm -hmm. And so we bundled that. And we bundled a paint program and we bundled like a text editor and we bundled a file manager, all these things that were separate. Mm -hmm became parts of the operating system. And then the operating system becomes like a new thing. And the baseline has to include a set of things. And mm -hmm. then we made the mistake. One of those things was a browser. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing repeated on the server. Because, you know, servers used to have file sharing and print sharing. Those used to be separate. And nobody argued about that. And then we're like, oh, we should put a web server. Mm. Oh, because, oh, you know, it's just a file server, but with different mechanics. Nope, that, whoa, that crosses a line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the, that whole thing, and that's what angered people because there's this view, if you take the worst view of those things, then it's, you're not just doing it for customers, you're doing it because you want to lock people in. Right. Well, the, two sides of a coin. Anything you do that you want to lock people in is also the same thing you do to make customers happy and give them what they want. Mm -hmm. and, and like, it's just sort of this two sides of like what it means. But I don't, I, I don't, there's nothing, I, like, I don't know things that individuals did mm -hmm. that you would look at today and go, like, oh, we should cancel that person for having done that licensing term or <laughs> having written that piece of code or done that. Because right. it, it just wasn't like that. And you have to always keep in mind that, like, we embraced fully only the paranoid survive. Mm -hmm. Like the whole, my whole career at Microsoft, I thought we were on the verge of going out of business the whole time. <laughs> that is crazy. I mean, given how dominant Microsoft was but, during a time. You know, imagine like I, I just sat, I got back from Cornell in the sun, in the snow and I just looked at the internet and I thought, this is the thing. Like we're going to wake up and the world is going to be running Macintosh with these goofy HTTP servers that we don't know anything about or Gopher servers using TCP IP that we don't make, using a file format called HTML that we don't understand. Yeah. And that seems way cooler than anything we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Proof, we're gone. Oh, and by the way, no one pays for any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Which, which at the time, obviously, a company being paid for software uh, would find threatening. Okay, I want to move on to, I think, maybe kind of the next stage of your career, 
right? Uh, you had the so office, many different stages, yeah. which is you wound up, you know, I think it's interesting because you kind of wound up running software used by billions. But next stage is you wound up running all of Office, PowerPoint, Word, Excel, uh, uh, Access, uh, Outlook, whole, Outlook, Outlook uh, yes. uh, you know, which probably you got a lot of feedback about. So how did that happen? And could you describe you know, the era in which you ran, how was it to run the takeover yeah, the organization? How was it to take it over? And how was it, you know, by the time you left office? Oh, well, it was obviously a complete disaster. And then it was amazing. So, <laughs> no. So the thing was, this is the thing that I think, one of the stories I tell about the, that era of Microsoft was um, that the company, as we just described, the, imagine, the, most people referred to Microsoft back then as the Borg. Mm -hmm. Like this sort of just relentless, huge, giant thing. It's, and really... By the way, that's a reference from the superior version of Star Trek, The Next Generation. Superior is a relative term. But it was... <laughs> it, the, the thing is, it, from the very earliest days, two things were true. One, Microsoft was very diversified as a company. And this was a key part of Bill's strategy from as far back as you can possibly even document the company. Mm -hmm. Like people who know the story think, oh, Microsoft did basic for the Altair and then the Tandy and a bunch of computers. But very, very quickly, they were doing games. They were doing other programming languages. They were doing a database. Then they did a, a communications, a modem program, then a word processor they brought in and they started building apps. And so the way that the company was from the early days and, and until I even got there, it was apps, systems and tools. Mm -hmm. Yep. I and mean, the so these had, were like basically totally different essentially continents of people, culture, they didn't get along, you know, they probably had like diplomat diplomatic relationships at best. These are totally different universes inside Microsoft. Uh, it, it was unbelievable. Like, you don't even know that. So I showed up and the first, one of the first Microsoft events I go to is someone um, that I knew from Cornell said, hey, we're doing this picnic, the systems picnic. You, you could go too, you'll just go with me. You know, we were all like 20 something. And so I go with, with this person to the picnic and it was like the OS2 picnic or whatever. And they had these big beach blankets. And the, the only thing I could think about was why is everybody here so old? <laughs> like everybody there just seemed like a grown up. and it was a picnic and there were like kids and I couldn't figure out like who has kids. <laughs> and it was because the operating systems group was a little bit older. Even the people who were hired by Microsoft sort of out of school, they were already like three or four years older than most of the people hired in apps out of school. And they had all these people they had hired from digital equipment to do Windows NT and from IBM and all this stuff. And so they, they just seemed like grownups. And, and then the apps team that I was part of, I was part of the apps team when I was hired. Mm -hmm. Then I went to work for Bill and then I came back to apps. But the apps team that I was part of, it was like college. Like it was just like what most people here think of when they when they were if they're Google long timers that kind of thing right, without right. any PhDs like it was all just bachelor degrees yeah and, or at best lots of people without degrees too and <laughs> and so the apps versus systems cultures were just completely different mm -hmm. and I I couldn't figure out what it meant because I didn't work in there but then this guy named Mike Maples who to people listening that's Mike Maples senior who is Mike Maples the investor's father. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike Maples at the time was at business school mm -hmm. and I got to know him later, but Mike Maples senior who had had a long career at IBM then got hired by Microsoft to run apps. Mm -hmm. And so he came in sort of as like this apps adult and, you know, he had worn blue suits and white shirts this whole time. And his big thing was he showed up with like checkered dress shirts, right. like cowboy shirts. And he once explained to me when I was working for Bill his view of apps versus systems. And he, he called it the two gardens theory. And that Microsoft is like, has two gardens. And the, one is the apps garden and the other is the systems garden. And the systems garden, you, you look at it and there's like dirt flying everywhere and tools, people getting cut and they're breaking tools and they're going crazy. But there's like a bunch of flowers at the end of the day, but it's very, very messy. And then you over here, and there's this beautiful apps garden and a bunch of people just standing around serenely observing their garden. Mm -hmm. And they made the garden without any bloodshed, without, they just, every day they did a little bit of gardening work, they made a little bit of progress and they made a nice garden. Mm -hmm. And you know, you could he hear that as like, 
very negative or very positive, depending on your sort of perspective. But the reason that those gardens exist like that is because it turns out it was two very fundamentally different problems that needed to get solved to get success in the business. On the systems side, you, you basically were at war with the hardware ecosystem that wasn't excited about Windows, with all of the developers who had better things to do with their time than write Windows programs, with this whole world. With, you know, someone like, how did you get a BIOS for a Windows PC written that worked? Well, you had to fly to Taiwan, mm -hmm. meet with like a me or whatever, and get them to do something that there's no addressable market yet. Right. You know, hi, Phoenix, please make a BIOS for our computer. And, yeah. and you, so you're sort of out over your skis. You're, you're basically stretching the truth. You're committing things in real time that don't exist. You're making a big, giant mess. So I think you know, I want to touch on two things you just brought up, both in the previous internet sto uh, story and on the apps, was, which is at the time, Microsoft was defined by, I would say, a level of paranoia and competitive aggression. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just real all out. We're going to, I mean, maybe a lot of things people should not have said in email, but all out, like, let's go out and crush the competition. Could you talk more about that, where that came from, and maybe some stories you remember about like that competitive, let's go dominate everybody's spirit. Because I think it's like that really defined that era for me. Yeah. So the, the competition is, it, it's very, very rooted in in Bill personally, how he just views life. Mm -hmm. And also <laughs> Steve Ballmer, who, although not a founder, is for all practical purposes, a member of the founding team, as mm -hmm. I now know we say in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and that's just Bill as a person. Yeah. He, I mean, like, he used to do this event at his, um, he had a, his parents had a, used to summer, his grandparents used to have a house in, in what's called Alderbrook, which is like a, on the water in the sound. And he used to go there for vacation and then he had a little vacation place and he used to do what's called the micro games. And I, that, that went on right up until I joined the company. So I, my boss went to like the last one, but he used to do the micro games, which was just like basically the company picnic. But Bill wouldn't do just like, you know, bring your family or your significant other or whatever, and let's just have a barbecue. Like instead, you have to show up and be prepared to like have pre-reading and trivia games and weird pickleball sports things and all the stuff that, and they kept <laughs> score. And, and like, it was like supposed to be just fun. And he turns it into like camp color war. This, and, this very know, aggressive and, competitive event. Right. And so... He was just like that. And he was like that about everything. Mm -hmm. And Steve, you know, basically people know this story. And he told it when he was on, on our audio show back Shoot, in the day. Yeah. But he, you know, he was like managed the basketball team and he played sports. And he has just that very classical sports competitiveness, mm -hmm. like team sport competitiveness. You know, strategy, compete, relentless practice. You know, he's up at 5.30 a.m. and that basketball league from hell at the pro club. And, see, you know, like he's yep. just, all, and now he owns a team and he gets to do that full time, which is great. And so that was just, so we had Bill, which was always about winning technically and being the most right. And Steve was always about winning the sale, winning with customers and winning in the market. And and then you just overlay a fear that both of them are going to fail at any given moment because they'd watch. Right? Remember, when Microsoft started as a company, they were selling basic to like 50 different computer mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. And in the first, by, the, by 1981, when the IBM PC came out, all those companies went out of business. Right. So he'd seen exactly how generational shifts decimate and annihilate the incumbents. And he, this, Bill's entire Microsoft career was around avoiding being one of those companies. For young, and so that's job. where that, which goes back to the Windows and Office and Two Gardens, because Office, unlike being born out of like creating an industry, was born out of breaking in to win an established industry. Right. You know, there were fifty odd word processors that right. the original Microsoft Word for DOS competed mm -hmm. with. Right. There was. You know, Excel had to compete with Lotus 123, which was the most dominant software company in the entire industry. They mm -hmm. were a billion dollar run rate company and synonymous with the purpose of owning a computer. Um, and so apps, instead of having to be out over their skis, they had to learn, they had to get on a plane, put on a suit, 
Probably not in that order. But put on a suit, get on a plane, <laughs> fly to Goldman Sachs, sit down with bankers, and say, what would make a spreadsheet that you would use instead of Lotus 1, 2, 3? Mm -hmm. Right, right. The word processing people had to do the same thing except fly to Washington, D.C., talk to a bunch of lawyers in federal court, and understand how will you write a brief in a new word processor better than you could in WordPerfect. Right, right. And then repeat that once PowerPoint became part of Microsoft in 1987. And so apps was this relentless refinement execution machine, one release every two years, get it out, fix it, quality, listen to customers, just churn, 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 which led to these completely different cultures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, when you talk about the competitive aggressive nature, and you know, now you work with a lot of startups, you know a lot of founders, how do you compare cultures? Like, is it kind of like Microsoft? Do you feel like, no, it's not even close? Do you feel like now we have more aggression, what, how do you see it from like, from the world that you had worked at to what you see now? It's super interesting. Like, I, you know, I hesitate always to make comparisons because yeah. whenever I do, I have two problems. One, I sound like some old man. And two, the people just say, no, it's different. Mm -hmm. And that's what young people say when they don't want to hear what you're saying. <laughs> and I know that because I said the same thing. Yeah. Like every person who worked at Hewlett Packard or at IBM that told me this is what's going to happen, I just laughed at them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you have no, nothing you could possibly say is relevant to me. And you just don't know it when you're 25 that that is complete crap. And you're going to realize that when it does happen to you. Yeah. But I, it is interesting. You see it. In different segments, you see different levels of, of competition. Like, look, we've all, we all saw the Slack versus Teams. Like, that seemed like very old school competition. Yeah. You know, it was <laughs> mismatched, you know, and the yeah. enterprise bundle changes that dynamic quite a bit. You know, um, Okta versus Active Directory was like that. Mm -hmm. But it was old school in, like, like, the most old school competitive thing you do in enterprise software is write, like, a 30-page white paper with like all sorts of 30 page reference 30 all third party references about why your competitor sucks and in those kind of battles they were just battles of like these 30 page white papers with quotes from gartner gartner and quotes from the yeah. press i was going to say the, the, the win is to get in the right gartner quadrant like that's the yeah win. that's the win yep right and so you know there's definitely that that aspect of it in other spaces like man like the the um Enterprise security space mm -hmm. is absolutely as bare knuckled as anything can be. Like it never ceases to amaze me just how killer the competition there is, which is weird because it's not a winner take all space. Like customers routinely own multiple tools mm -hmm. in the space, mm -hmm. but man, and maybe it's just because of the founders or the technology, it's so, you know, it's a harsh world of technology because you're defending against breaches and bad mm -hmm. actors and stuff. That one is very, and then in, but in, in, the, in sort of a lot of spaces, it's very apps like in a lot right. of, you know, like in the task management space and the work management space, right. they tend to be very apps like where right. we're just going to execute and execute and execute and maybe we'll win. Like I was at a company um, a couple of days ago you know, a public one that does software and work management, you know, and they're very much like, we have these features, we have these features to do, we're going to keep executing, you know, we are going to share more code, we're going to be efficient, we're going to have consistent user experience. Like, it sounded office-like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, very iterative, yeah. Oh, yeah. executive, execution-focused. But, you, you know, certainly the crypto world fits the, you know, we're out over our skis. Right. Like, you know, <laughs> And, yeah. and that's what makes me very empathetic with with those founders. And I will say the same thing about Chat GPT right now. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. like it is completely over its skis. Like, because <laughs> it's it's mind boggling. It it there's nothing you can use in software that will blow your mind more. Except it could also blow your mind with completely fantastical, false, bad things. Oh yeah. Yeah. But yeah. and. And so, like, having your mind blown, like, with super bad things, like, it's the rough equivalent to if in those 1994 demos of the Internet, every third link was, like, some virus that formatted your hard drive. <laughs> like, that would have made my demos, demos very, very different. Right. Than, like, you know, 
here's an intelligent conversation between you know Napoleon and George Bush about the future of Ukraine, and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, when did this happen? And it just sounds perfectly lucid. Oh yeah, uh, almost. And, you know, and, and unless you happen to know date of birth, you're just like, wow. So, interesting stuff to walk away from on that conversation. The, I uh, guess question then is like, what do you tell founders with respect to building company culture? You know, learnings from what you've seen at office, office culture with like execution, iteration focused, windows, the cults of personality who you've dealt with. If you are a new founder who's just starting something, how do you think about setting the right culture then? Well, the, you know, the, the thing for me is, is that I, I think of founders and sort of there's two, there's a fork in the road. You're either completely determined that what you're doing has no competitor and you're completely a unique snowflake, not to use the name of a startup to confuse the whole thing, but you're a unique <laughs> snowflake yeah. that, you know, you just will do your thing and the world will come to you. Mm -hmm. Or you know exactly who your competitors are and you can make a list. And that's your two options. The thing is, if you know who your competitors are and you can make a list, you need to finish the list and have a list of every single feature that your competitors do and what it is you're doing to, to be better than them. Mm -hmm. And there's two ways to be better. You have all their features or you have a new and a better way to do the most important set of their features that mm -hmm. will cause people to want to use you. SaaS was sort of a one-time thing that you could be like X, but be the SaaS X and that will just attract a certain set of people. But mm -hmm. you quickly find out that only attracts the leading edge people. Mm -hmm. And you need to have like the whole shebang before you get mm -hmm. the tail of customers. Mm -hmm. If you think you're the most unique software in the world, it is true. Every once in a while, there's something that everybody looks at and goes, nobody's ever done this before. Mm -hmm. But it's not really self-identifiable. Like mm -hmm. you have to get over yourself. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the way the industry works even if you aren't, and I have a great example with someone you know very well, where, where like a dear friend of mine, Ray Ozzy, who started, you know, amazing software that, that we all know, mo important, most importantly, um, what became uh, Lotus Notes, Notes, which was a groupware collaborative thing. So yeah. think, imagine if like Asana and, and Outlook were sort of one product that was completely That's programmable right. and had a yeah. database and peer-to-peer. -peer. Mm -hmm. Imagine that whatever, if that meant anything to anyone. But Ray, <laughs> he always believed in the, so believed in the art of software that he, he often would, and I wrote about this in Hardcore Software, he often would define notes as not being like anything else. And it turns out you could keep doing that, but the, the market, in particular, the Gartner and their Magic Quadrant, they can't do a Magic Quadrant called the Lotus Notes Magic Quadrant. Mm -hmm. Here's Lotus <laughs> Notes up and to the right with no other products. That will, Nobody will buy that. Nobody believes it. So they have to invent something that can include other people. Mm -hmm. And so even if you think you're unique, the industry is going to bring competition to you whether you think it's completely bogus and random or not. Mm -hmm. And... So that's what often happens. And then you're completely blindsided and you're defensive and you can't get over yourself and you just keep saying, we're not like anything else. Mm -hmm. And you can muscle your way through that. But like what happened with Lotus Notes was it got put in this category called um, enterprise messaging. Mm -hmm. A groupware. And groupware. And either, I think it was actually called EMG or something like that, not to be confused with the ES, but enterprise messaging and groupware. And either you did email and calendaring or you didn't. And then it, it did other things. Right. And the problem was Lotus was better at, uh, Notes was better at other things than it was at mail and calendaring. And Exchange couldn't do other things to save its life. It could <laughs> only do mail and calendaring. <laughs> yeah. And only with Outlook. Mm -hmm. And so it was like this vertically walled garden of mail and calendaring. But you combine that with 20,000 salespeople around the world, and it's pretty formidable. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back in time to 2003, 2004. Uh, could you paint a picture of what happened with uh, Windows Vista? And maybe as Longhorn. to- Longhorn. Uh, uh, Longhorn. Uh, uh, with <laughs> okay, so just want to hard pivot, Windows Vista. <laughs> Windows Vista. Like, we, there's an easy softball question on advice, and now we're like, oh, let's get right into it. Right? No, but that's also our first kind of, uh, you know, grabbing a bunch of popcorn and just watching Steven Sanofsky at work, right? Like, that's about the time, you know, mid 2000s is when we joined and we got to see it. So, you know, yeah. 
Yeah. It's also, I think, the time when, one, uh, the vision of Longhorn, which became Windows Vista, was so inspiring, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Avalon, Avalon Vinifest, yeah. Indigo, uh, all of that, which maybe only a few people in the I audience think part of remember. it is just the demos oh yeah the demos were fantastic uh, with Don Box and Chris Anderson a lot, a lot of these folks PDC 2005 what in my mind probably the best PDC Microsoft right. ever did but I also think like you know it also kind of <laughs> taught me um, a lot about how Windows was built there was kind of this whole culture about how well, Windows is built and architected from ZRB, ZBBs, war rooms, etc. And which is very interesting because when you wound up taking over a few years later, right, I think you kind of had to undo a lot of that. So if you kind of had to paint a picture of how Windows was built, what happened with Vista, because I think that sets the scene for Steven coming in and, you know. And, sh- and also I think release management as, as a function by itself. I don't think anybody else had actually thought of it as like a particular function and only at Microsoft and I come in I was like wow okay release management is a thing by itself because it is so complex and you have all these different teams of people working together that you have to think about this as a function and have people grow up the release management career path sure there's a lot there and I I you know, this is where I run the risk of just really offending some people who work Let's do it. Hard. But do it. the way I'm going to disclaim <laughs> it is, like, I had nothing at all to do with Vista, and and which also pisses people off. Oh, yeah. Because uh, people will blame the fact that Office had nothing to do with Vista as part of the problem. Although we did actually try. Like, I literally had a dedicated dev team in Office yeah. called the Longhorn <laughs> Platform Team. 30 developers who were basically, like, you tell us what you want a Longhorn version of Office to do, yeah. and Joel and his team will do them. Right, well, hold on. Let me, make, let me make it interesting. There's probably a set of people who would believe that if you had let Office use .NET, right, that Windows Vista would have gone differently. <laughs> okay, that that's just nonsense talk. So that's like, no, that... <laughs> You you lost me at Office and .NET. Then I got to do. I have like a whole. There's literally a whole oh. post on all of that. So I'll just skip over all right, all right, all right. your Windows fantastical Vista. world where .NET was relevant to Office. Windows Vista. Windows Vista. But wait, here's what. There, there's a very real thing that that happened here. And it, you know, one of the Microsoft when I started, there was a, a series of about ten books that everybody got. Like just when you started on your first day of work, they all were sitting in your super thick oak northwest wood bookcase right when you got there and it was part of the tradition and you know there was like a 68,000 reference manual a a 286 reference manual a 386 reference manual depending on when you started you know (laughs) and then there was like the hacker dictionary the whole earth catalog and the mythical man month right Right. And and so one of the lessons, the big lesson for Mythical Mammoth that everybody knows is scheduling and adding more engineers doesn't make the product go sooner. But there's another discussion in there about second system syndrome. Mm. And second system syndrome happens when a team that's successful takes a step back and says, okay, wow, that was su- such a mess to get that hugely successful product out the door. It has all of these things that are wrong. Now we're going to redesign the whole thing and fix it. And then they vanish for like a decade and mm. nothing ever happens. <laughs> and that is all comes out of a very famous IBM project when they were going to redo the mainframe called Project Stretch. And that was because the first mainframes were had all these problems. And Project Stretch never finished, but when they reset the whole thing and started over, then they got like the 360 computer and stuff like that all put together. If I got that whole timeline right. But what happened was we had done Windows 95 and Windows NT4, which was the server operating system and the workstation. And we had these sort of two operating systems. We had to reconcile that, but we needed to get the Windows 95 stuff, like plug and play and the, the file graphical shell and all that, to the NT code base. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That ended up taking like five years. And so in the interim, we had to do Windows 98 and Windows 98 Second Edition and Windows 98, Windows Millennium Edition. Yeah. And then we got Windows 2000 done with yeah. Millennium Edition. Yeah. But it turns out, even though it took five years, the Windows 2000, which was supposed to be the Windows 95 vacation of the NT code base, wasn't finished. And you still couldn't play games on it. And there was a whole bunch of stuff that didn't work. 
So they had to finish that. And that led to Windows XP, mm. which was sort of, some people think that was it. We were done with Windows after that. Right. But what happened was it, Windows XP then was, turns out, was a super bad security problem and had mm. to do the service pack that was supposed to take nine months that took three years and SB2. all this other stuff. Yeah. But what, what it really did was everybody was like, whew, okay, we now have a base. That was messy. That mm -hmm. took us from 1995 to 2004 mm -hmm. to get everything done. But in about 2001, we're like, okay, we really need to redo everything. Mm -hmm. Project Stretch. And it became like the vision for what to do became like the fixing of everything that we didn't get done from like 1990 to 2000. Mm -hmm. And so that included like, Finally, we're going to get much, much better forms, which are dialogue boxes or screens or whatever you want to call oh, them. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're, going to, we're going to finally fix the file system, and that becomes WinFS. Yeah. We're finally going to do something better than Windows Sockets, and that becomes whatever it was called, communication services. For <laughs> WCF, uh, yeah. Indigo, which In, became WCF. Yeah. So, we get all, so that becomes the plan. Oh, and we're going to hire designers, and we're going to have a cool look which we never really had and then you just sort of get like everything piling on and you combine that with the over your skis culture of windows where everybody is like yeah we can do that and we can do that and all of a sudden three years pass by and they're not anywhere near getting a release done at mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. and, and also this is one that's very um historical and not really a problem now but there's this notion of like as you guys know like you get these ship vehicles and either you're on that train oh, or yeah. you're not. Oh, and if you're God, not on yes. the train, yeah. you don't get distribution because there's no internet. Yeah, like, but, well, this is a very important point, which kids these days won't <laughs> understand. But the way it worked was, uh, you know, back in the day, Windows would come on a DVD uh, and you would install it. And unless you were, you, you could be on one of these DVDs, which would be beta one, beta two, the RTM release, which would probably be like six months or a year apart you were not getting your software to your customers. It's not something they could hit refresh on the browser and go actually use. But also, yeah. So uh, you would have to fight for your launch to be in these bills. So you would have one, if you, if you, so if you missed a date, the train would leave the station and become <laughs> a DVD. So you had to wait for the next train, which was probably a six months later. And you'd have to fight for getting bug fixes. My first format experience with Microsoft was you'd go to what is called a war room and you say there is a bug and you are fighting for that bug to be fixed and you would fight some high powered, usually scary figure. And because every single fix could threaten the train. And you had right. to really justify, and if, if you didn't get your bug fix on this train, your customers would not get that fix for six or eight months. So that's kind of like our formative experience. Oh, right? yeah. Many more months. Than that. And not only, oh, totally. I, the reason for that was because if you broke the train or your thing was broken, it oh, couldn't yeah. be fixed. Oh, yeah. Like you, you, and so. Yeah, and this I think uh, for us too, it, it, we, our formative experience, as Shriram said, was Visual Studio. And I think at that time it was like 18 months to two year cycles. Which for an IDE, like now it's just unthinkable to be like, oh, the software is going to like, you know, right. the next version is going to be two years out from today. Uh, but at that time, I, I think just as like Shriram said, both on the, the Visual Studio, the IDE side, but also on like the components leading up to it, like the CLR and stuff like that, you kind of have to like, not just figure out how to get on the train, but make sure that the train isn't broken. Like if right, you right. were responsible for breaking the train, that is it. Like that is just unforgivable. Exactly. And and there's an interesting point in here to point out why, you know, you kids hearing these stories think, well, that's interesting. It doesn't apply. But in fact, it, it does in exactly the opposite way. Because one of the things that knowing that you're shipping in two years did is it forced you to think big. Mm -hmm. Like you had to imagine what is the world, what world do I want to invent for two years from now in computing? Where is hardware going to be? Where are peripherals going to be? What kind of things are people going to be doing? And you actually had to come up with ideas for how to evolve the product that would place it two years from now. Mm -hmm. And so releases, they were, took two years, but they looked like they took two years. Mm -hmm. Like there were huge changes, yeah. which turns out to also be very disruptive and mm -hmm. to customers. The flip side is what happens today is when people hear that, they're like, oh, well, I just think up the idea and by four o'clock in the afternoon, it's in production and, I, and we're great. 
But very, very rarely do people think, what are we going to do for two years from now? Yeah. And the thing is, you, you don't incrementally get to two years from now by shipping something at four o'clock three times a week. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's why the world today is in Silicon Valley is so different mm -hmm. than the rest of the, the world in a mm -hmm. sense. In Silicon Valley, like, okay, we're using some task manager for our team. We're using task manager for our team. It's getting a little bit better every day. Boom, here's a whole new way to do tasks for a team. Let's just switch our 30 person company to this one. And that's how innovation happens. You just switch to whole other products that have a different view on how to do things. That would have been a major release with the product you were using, but it's not going to happen. And the problem with that is if you work at some giant retailer, you can't just wake up one day and change the tool that 10,000 people do. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're, they're not open to switching work like that. And so that's part of why like, you don't see like G Suite or whatever it's called now in, in like 10,000 person companies outside of Silicon Valley or the tech world because they, they just, they, they're not able to change how everybody does everything. Oh yeah, even <laughs> enterprises are not fond of just switching everything and training everybody at the drop of a hat. And, and so if you're used to how innovation happens in this step function kind of thing where you just take a hard turn, so it's not, so the thing is, is that neither of them are perfect. Right. And, and it's just, there's a prevailing view that the shipping every day is just a huge net full improvement over everything. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it, it's only an improvement for a certain set of things. Right. 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 Which is like fixing bugs, fixing performance bottlenecks, addressing a security hole. Like all that is like a zillion times better than Windows Update and that crap right. we had to come up mm -hmm. with. Oh my gosh, yeah. So I want to fast forward a few years because Windows Vista was a mess. There was a long horn reset. It gets out the door, right? The old regime winds up retiring. You you know, get put in charge. By the way, I have this amazing memory of, uh, I think it was in 2006, the company meeting, uh, or maybe 2007, actually, the company meeting. And um, it was uh, the very first time. The Safeco. Uh, at Safeco. Yeah. Um, and this is like a huge baseball field, and it's a whole, like, you know, it, you, everyone gets worked up. Steve Ballmer is kind of the main event. But I, this is the very first time you had been announced as, I think, president of Windows, which is like a huge organization. And I will never forget, Steven's name gets announced, the music plays, you bound out on stage, and the place just erupts. Uh, you know, it just, it's, it's like a standing <laughs> ovation. It just erupts. Because I think the first time we talk about Windows 7, it's one of my defining memories. So yeah. could you talk about what it was like to you, to, from office, coming over, what you saw, taking over Windows and the path to Windows 7? Well, it's easy to sound like the hero of that movie, the way you describe it, but it was super difficult. It was super painful. And it was a huge change for a lot of people. And, and I, you know, what really happened was they had gone from 2001, where they were supposed to do a service pack for XP that took three months, but took three years. But from 2001, it took until 2004 to sort of do, okay, we're just going to cut a bunch of stuff and ship what became Vista. Right. And that, that release to manufacturing in the summer, I think, of um, 2006. And I joined Windows in March of 2006. And from that day, we just started figuring out what would we do to, to get back to some rhythm mm -hmm. of shipping Windows. The, the thing that I, but the thing was, it was like definitely one of these, I've been training my whole life for this job because <laughs> I started off in development tools and yeah. the first product I shipped was on the first Windows PDC DVD-ROM and it was developed, the C++ compiler and tools. I worked on the libraries for, for Windows. And then I shipped the first Windows dev tools for, for Windows NT and all that stuff. And then I worked for Bill where we spent most of the time trying to figure out how to get Windows 95 you know, evangelized around the company and put together as a strategy to whatever degree Bill was was driving that with Brad Silverberg. And then I was in office where we were growing our enterprise business and all this other stuff. And we basically just were separate from Windows. Okay. Like we, we couldn't really rely on them, but we didn't need to. In fact, our customers wanted to work on the old version of Windows whenever possible, which is a very important lesson for me later on in Windows 8. And so 
you know, I came and like it was very, very clear. And I did all the things that you would expect somebody to do when they show up. And you were there and you got to read all of the blog posts and everything mm -hmm. along the way, which is, okay, it's day zero. I'm just going to start meeting with people. And so I'm going to dozens and dozens of like, you know, small teams. Like this is the team that does accessibility. This is the team that does, you know, European localization. This is the team that does sustaining bug fixes. This is the shell team and this is the x you know you pick the technology and there's like a team of right. 20 or 30 or whatever people and meeting with them and then i'm meeting with like whoever the org chart says are the key people like these are the first levels of the organization i did hundreds of one-on-ones and things like that and you have to do that mm -hmm. and it became very very clear very quickly and i have a whole post in hardcore software on yep. literally the the lessons that came out of that and I, and I wrote it just using the my writing process we described mm -hmm. earlier. And I just said, look, I'm going to write this all down. I sent like, which was basically a secret memo to Bill and like one other person that were, these were my observations on, on Windows. And I don't even, that's one of the things I didn't even include in hardcore software other than to excerpt it a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and I just said, uh, what amounts to like this place is screwed up as you might think it is, it's worse. <laughs> and... And it, here's it, why. And in what like way? The, yeah. The people aren't empowered. Like decisions don't stick. Like it reads like the same generic problem with any team anywhere. Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing. Like you read it. I read it, you know, in current time and I'm like, oh, this sounds like a messed up team. Mm -hmm. Like there you have it. It's mm -hmm. like a messed up team with, and you always, and you always say, and it's, but it's got great people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the truth is it did. And so we, I had to figure out what to actually operationalize. Mm hmm. And that's where I learned like a bunch of things that I wasn't really sure of. Like you learn, why is it when somebody takes over a dysfunctional organization, do they always bring people with them? Hmm. Like, why do you, why do they do that? Why don't they just work with the great people that are on the team? And it's because you have to bring in people that actually know the answer to the questions that you're going to ask and will answer them the way you want them answered. Hmm. And no matter what, the people that are there, and here's one example. Like I needed to have people that were running the various parts of the team that weren't going to, when something came up, they weren't going to stop what they were doing and wait to schedule a meeting with me so that we could decide it. Mm -hmm. Like that was absolutely my pet peeve of working with Windows for 15 years or whatever. Like right. I, I could not stand the way that everything in Windows was some executive escalation. We had to have a meeting with the vice president. And, and, and also, like, two teams working together that couldn't agree, oh, let's meet with their vice president and, you know, declare a winner and force one of them to do so. I, I couldn't stand any of that dynamic. And we never, ever did that in office. Never. Mm -hmm. And so the problem was everybody who worked there, even from the very first day I got there, like, literally, I'm, I'm unpacking a box from the boxes from my office in my new office, and someone shows up and needs to solve some problem between... ATI and NVIDIA graphics drivers. And I'm like, A, I don't work on Vista and it's still got six months to ship or something. And B, huh? <laughs> like, I don't know. I literally don't know anything about solving problems. I don't, I've never even heard of ATI. How right. am I going to solve this problem for you? It's like, it needs a vice president approval. And like, I can't tell you how many times I literally was in some loop called vice president approval. Right. And so, those kind of things had to be fixed. And the way, the only way you can do that is by having people in jobs mm -hmm. that look at somebody who thinks that and say, no, we're not going to do it that way. Mm. And the people that grew up and were trained to do that for better or worse. Look, and you can't begrudge it because it wasn't like Windows had failed. Like it was messy and gross, but it was like the, the largest business on earth. Like, it, it, you know, it was half of the largest company on the planet. Right. Right. So it, you can't just say that's all wrong, yeah. right. but you can say, well, we've got a bunch of problems and the trajectory we're on, those mm -hmm. problems are going to become structural and systematic and yeah. bad. So th this is actually very, very interesting era I want to get into because I would say this is the era where you saw the rise of Apple as the competitor in many ways. And there's multiple lenses to this. There is the mobile lens, which I want to get to, but I want to maybe get your take on how annoying were the Mac versus PC ads at the inside? And what is kind of the impact that they had on anything that Microsoft did? Well, those, you know, I'm Mac, I'm a PC. Those ads 
were were brutal. And and I there's a whole post on that in yeah. hardcore software on those yep. ads. And they the thing about those ads were they were just exactly just what you would expect Steve Jobs. They were completely in touch with how the world perceived PCs. Mm. And say to the 90% level, they were perfectly accurate. Mm. And of course that 10% drove me absolutely bonkers <laughs> that they were wrong. Yeah. You know, like when they say Macs don't get viruses. Yeah. Well, okay. They there are viruses on the Mac, but most people don't experience them because nobody really cares that they're nobody's really targeting Macs, nobody's phishing on Macs. Mm. There's no outlook on Macs, which is how most viruses were transmitted, blah, 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 blah. But in a relative sense, there were no viruses on the Mac. Right, right. You know, or updates or promises made. Like, all, I go through all of them. Like, literally, I actually produced the spreadsheet of all of the ads right. uh, in, in hardcore software. And, and the thing is, is that what's so hard is, to, is to, for people to understand that it really has only been in the past two years that Macintosh was even registering as a competitor to Windows. Mm. And it is in the U.S. right now for consumer laptops. So laptops that you would buy for, for home, mm. for school, for personal use, even if you have a job, like that laptop share, I think it's probably 50% Mac now in the U.S. Right, right. And, you know... You, there are people who measure this for a living that would either challenge that or tell me it's even more, you know, you pick. And, but that's very recent. Yeah. And, and so, but back then it was brief, the, you know, those ads were running all through Vista. Mm -hmm. There was a welcome Vista ad and then a welcome to windows seven ad mm -hmm. that sort of bracketed that campaign. Yeah. And I windows seven, by and large, made it very, very difficult to do that advertising. Oh, totally, anyway. totally. I was going to say, you know, just to our previous conversation uh, in Windows 7, I remember how it was in that uh, company meeting where you came up on stage, but I remember the days leading up to it, and we were, like, pretty new into Microsoft. Very, I mean, you had talked about, like, everybody being older around you. That's kind of how it was for us. Like, we had coworkers who had kids who were not that far in age from us. And uh, yeah. and so we were like way younger, way junior, first job out of college and, you know, program managers, mm -hmm. which was very unusual. You don't have program managers straight out of college. Um, and uh, I remember the morale at that time, like a week, two weeks, a month before this announcement was made, it was low. Like it was not that Windows was dying or failing, like you said, but it was this big flagship mm -hmm. product that is kind of going off course. And the company just seemed to have a really hard time coming to terms with it. Like you had this culture of like always dominating, always being at the top. And people, especially our managers, were all like lifers at Microsoft. They'd been there for so long. They could not fathom this world that they were in where they have to come to terms with the fact that there was this, um, there was Vista, just train wreck. And then you had these like ads that were just constantly targeting, you know, the souls of these people. It was just yeah. really brutal to watch. So when you came up on stage, then it wasn't like, you know, obviously you have, you've already built all of that credibility. But from our standpoint, it's like when we came back to our teams and we're like, what do you think? People were like, we have a shot. We have a shot at yeah. this and it's going to be good. Like I finally have hope that this is yeah. going to be good. And I remember um, through the whole, the next year, couple of years of just sitting in the war rooms, seeing you make decisions on like what goes in, what doesn't go out. And, you know, we were all at the other end of it. Like I was in Visual Studio and, you know, there was just like these big cuts that were made on like, no, this does not make the train. Mm -hmm. We are not going to have this in. Oh, .NET, like, no, we're not going to do that. Like this is the version and we have decided and that's it. And you were just very, very clear. And you had this like, image I, I think from our standpoint it's like oh sanofsky is very aggressive oh yeah he's making this like you know oh my god like he's just making these cuts and these calls that are just brutal what will these teams do and then windows 7 shipped and was massively successful like i know you are never going to say that but it was just massively massively successful 
from just like public image standpoint and from restoring sentiment in people that windows is back on track and uh, i think there was you're just like understating how it was oh, before yeah. and after um and well, how the ads yeah, just like I took it off it one thing one thing that's super interesting is you know there was the sort of the the lore or the image of what i was doing and what was being done like uh, as an example i'm not going to dispute your memories or or anything but like <laughs> I, i seriously never went to a war room meeting i didn't even know where the war room was and i do i know that in our war room which we never called it war we called it the ship room but ship the room. ship room <laughs> was was a place where basically like at, you know the month before we were getting to beta is when mostly the test managers decided whether or not a fix was destabilizing or not right. and dev managers would put the code changes up and talk about them right right and grant george who ran that meeting who was the head of testing the vice president had a testing always you know the basic rule was just come prepared and this is the easiest meeting in the world mm -hmm. and it was only bad when somebody was clearly trying to pull a fast one <laughs> but there's something that one of the things i didn't write about in hardcore software that i was thinking of was i didn't write about when did i really ever do something and this would be a meeting that you guys wouldn't have seen but what we did is each of the milestones of a project each of the teams and i wrote about this organization in the, in the substack which is you know each of the teams that were made up of about 30 or 40 engineers we did a meeting each milestone and there were like four milestones for the product where they showed up and presented a standard template deck mm -hmm. of this is how many engineers we have these are the features we're doing and this is how we support the product vision and that was a meeting that i went to mm -hmm. and that was a meeting we created sort of in the office team And mm -hmm. it was literally we we called them checkpoints. Yeah, they weren't reviews. They weren't executive. In fact, I had to write a whole blog post, which you might even remember, where I said checkpoints are not reviews. Mm, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and, and like if you come to a checkpoint meeting and you leave doing different stuff than when you came, that's your fault, not mine. Yeah, like I didn't make you do different stuff. You clearly were confused about how this whole thing works. I, I think just so, just so you know, I think Shriram and I were like five levels or six levels removed from you. Seven, eight. So, <laughs> so there was possibly no way that we were actually in like the same meetings together. If it was, it was not good news for us. Yep. Uh, it was usually some escalation with some VP who disagreed with another VP, and we are usually the code monkeys. Oh yeah. We're like pulled into like go demo yeah, it, something. One of the worst meetings. Well, you were, right, Shriram, you were over in Ray's team by then, and you were still in dot net right oh, yeah. yes great right. memory yeah hey, you know, one of the so, worst thing, one of the worst you know that's worked for me <laughs> well we, we we blame you for everything you know one of the worst things at microsoft by the way at the time was you know one day you'd wake up and all of a sudden you're you're just been cc'd and like 25 other people and like synopsky and ray or all these bunch of like you know and then the architects uh, all these there and you're like you're like why am i here how do i just get out of this right it's kind of a high stakes situation right your neutral response is get out of it and hopefully not have your head cut off but every once in a while right if you were really bold you could land an email response in there and make an impression and one of the best feelings of the young part of my career is in somebody would little r which is to send you a personal email being like Good job, right? And right, yeah. uh, and if it was a somebody who was a skip low, you're like, yes, that was my win for the year. Um, okay, so <laughs> Windows Seven, I think Arthi is saying it's so important. Windows Seven was a huge success on multiple levels. You know, one was I think just commercially, but I think the other part of it was Microsoft just needed that, right? They were so low. I mean, it's kind of hard to quantify the sort of the feeling of a hundred thousand person organization, but. It really stung that your competitor was not beating you, but they were making fun of you, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, I, that really, really stung. And especially the like company just hard. And so you coming in Windows Seven, cleaning it up, Windows Seven. You kind of like the Star Trek movies. You had this thing of the odd numbers being really good and the even numbers being bad or whatever. It was a fantastic release, and it really, I think, saved the company in so many, so many ways. At least from like a psychological perspective. Now. Well, it did say that, it, it, like the thing that it did was it just it kept the operating system relevant in terms of just running programs. Yeah. But we had a much bigger problem, yeah. which was nobody was writing new ones. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And that was the real problem. And so we bought time, but because most people who worked at Microsoft that were cheering at the most of them generally only used software written by Microsoft, which continued to get built. Mm -hmm. They weren't out there trying to find the newest latest thing That's that was right. running on the internet or on, and 
So it was good, but we were in this very long decline in relevancy to developers. Oh, yes. And Windows That's 7 me. just kept the core, like, buying a PC wasn't horrible thing yep. going. Yep. Right. So Even if you were just going to load Chrome. Oh, yeah. Uh, which maybe, you know, we kind of skipped the whole conversation about mobile and iPhone, iPad, but maybe just kind of fast forwarding to today, which is another huge fast forward. But uh, how would you kind of surmise, let me just take in sequence, the state of the art of laptop computing, right? And personal PC computing. Apple has come out with the M star series of chips. You know, uh, I have one right here. They seem so far ahead of anything I've seen from any of the uh, Intel based computers. What is, you know, for what do you think of as desktop laptop computing? What do you think is interesting? What do you see the world headed over the next couple of years? Well, by far, there's really two things that make, you know, the Mac interesting. I will caveat this with saying the laptop itself, modulo what Apple may or may not do to the operating system in terms of running phone applications, the, the phone completely dominates computing. Hmm. Like you know, there, there's no question that like the number of people using a computer is the the population of Earth, and that computer is a smartphone, and all the PCs in the world are still the very best case, you know, one eighth or one ninth of right. smartphones. So and they're never gonna it's never gonna become half. Right. Like it, it's just not in the cards. That said, what Apple has done is really two things. One, they, they've been relentless at, you know, first they were, they were building the Mac OS and evolving the API for building apps, but that only took them so far. But then they, were, they forked the code and built the phone OS from that same base. Mm -hmm. And now they've been bringing the phone back to add these capabilities that were sort of latent there. So mm -hmm. you want to plug in USB storage, you want to do this with networking, all of these things. And they've been doing these consistently. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they've been jettisoning, jettisoning old things from the Mac. Hmm. And so the Mac has become more phone-like when it comes to security, reliability, because they've basically forced applications to incrementally modernize over the past 10 years or so. Right. And that's just super, super important. And so that transition from Carbon to Cocoa to, um, to AppKit has been very, very important because unlike anything Microsoft ever did, they just got rid of APIs and said, you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And unlike stuff that we wrestled with, they're like, and this part of the system is just locked down and you're not going to change it. And we're not just going to allow these programs to run. And that is a very, very real impact on the security, the reliability, the battery life, and the overall robustness of the mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Then they just slid in their own ARM chip and chipset. And that yeah. like allowed them to launch the fan and to run mobile apps if they want and make it super, super good on battery life. Mm -hmm. And also perform in ways with devices that do things that the phones started doing. So mm -hmm. all of the AI stuff that can be processed, all of the crypto stuff that can be, pro all of that stuff. And, and so that's made their laptop sort of a moderate step function in laptop computing. Mm -hmm. You know, the truth is you're, most people are still using them to do Photoshop, to do the to run Chrome. There's nothing, nobody's using their Macs to do things completely different than they ever did before, which mm -hmm. is not something you could say about phones, which every day mm -hmm. you do things on your phone that you never envisioned doing on a PC. Right. You know, the Macs still don't have, you know, all of the capabilities that phones have, including touch and things like that. But they they really that's the thing that's so different. And so Windows you know, and I, I write about this in the very last post, and it's very tough to write, and I, it, it, it can sound like rude or bitter or any sort of, but like the truth is, is it jettisoned everything that we tried to do from Windows 8, like immediately. Mm -hmm. So it got off the ARM train. It got off the new API train. It got off the touch train. And so, you know, it's 10 years later, it can't jump back on. 
Right. Like Apple has had 10 years to sort of innovate on the laptop form factor while rapidly innovating on the phone and bringing those capabilities to the laptop. Right. And without a mobile strategy for Microsoft, they're stuck at the very, very best just trying to build a laptop without a fan. Mm -hmm. Forget how secure it is or anything. Like they've given up on all of that. All they, you know, so if Intel does everything right, at some point in a few years, there might be a PC running x86 without a fan. It's still going to be insecure. It's, it's, not, it's still not really going to have the battery life. And it's still not going to have any new software unless it shows up in a browser. When you look forward, you know, that's kind of a school of thought that the phone that we see have today in our hands, uh, you know, the 14 Max, whatever, on the iPhone side, is kind of about the best we can do. And after kind of the initial burst of innovation that we saw in the first four or five years, every year, you know, you know, it's like, well, there's a new iPhone. It's a bit faster. It's a bit bigger. The camera's a bit better. There's maybe like one or two, you know, um, uh, whiz bang things in there, but it's mostly just a slab of glass that runs a computer really, really fast. So do you think like we are kind of at the tail end of the smartphone innovation cycle and maybe waiting for a new burst of computing innovation from somewhere else? It's a pretty cynical take. And it, one way to look at it is think about how, how automobiles evolved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like you have this very long time where they just sort of got bigger and slightly more reliable. And and then like, you know, along comes Japan mm -hmm. and they just re they just upend manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And then along comes Chrysler and the minivan mm -hmm. and like a whole new approach to building a car comes along. And then mm -hmm. along comes the SUV. And, and yet the whole that whole time, they're basically gas combustion engines. And now you look back and you compress them all and you just say they were all just gas cars because Tesla came along. Mm -hmm. And so the, the thing about phones, it, it's twofold. One, you know, we've had step function changes, mm -hmm. you know, in how the phone works, whether it's different kinds of cameras that really change the, the way it works, different kinds of auxiliary chipsets, adding capabilities that you never thought would be in a phone and so on. And, and then it gets a little bit stable. And if you look back and try to compress them, you get very cynical and you say they're all the same. Mm -hmm. The biggest difference was not everyone on earth ever had a car. And so now all of a sudden, China is getting cars for the first time. India is going to get cars for the first time. Yeah. And so that's itself, EVs are going to disrupt the car market because the, for the first time, people are going to get cheaper, more energy efficient, easier to manufacture, lighter weight cars, and so on. Yeah. The problem with phones is everyone on Earth has one. So if anything radically different is going to come along, it has to be like the mother of all technology <laughs> disruptions mm -hmm. that yeah. causes every single person on Earth to want a new experience. Yeah. Uh, crypto crypto GPT. <laughs> yeah, crypto which GPT. Is a very, very weird thing to say. Yeah. Which I, of course, think gets gets to Elon's master plan of colonizing Mars, because then at least we could grow a whole other over. planet <laughs> which to got to get products sold to. But nothing has ever faced that. Like literally, the only thing like that is fire. But <laughs> after that, like plumbing, electricity, you know, running water, television, radio, movies, cameras. Like there's washing machine. There is nothing that penetrated all of Earth. Right, right. And smartphones are it. Yeah. Wow. And and it's just the it's it's so you got to admit that's a pretty high bar. So I'm not willing to just like poo poo whatever Apple does under the guise of like innovation because like that's a hard job. Right. Like replacing seven billion smartphones with like something way better so better that no one's thought of it, that's really hard. Yeah. So I do think a lot of the innovation will take place in small ways in software that Apple will try to make part of the hardware experience or Google yeah. will try to make part of the hardware experience. Yeah. But there's not going to be like, you know, and that's why people are very get very excited. Maybe it'll all be glasses, but we're not all going to start wearing glasses. Like that's not the earth. It could be 100 million people, maybe 200. You know, it could be some lot of people, but it's mm. not all of Earth. You know, it might yeah. be like color television. Yeah, makes right. sense. Stephen, this is like, you know, I think we're coming kind of close to the end. But I wanted to ask one question 
especially for our audience, they'd be really interested in this. Um, you know, through your career, you've probably worked with, met, now, you know, coach, mentor, or work in some capacity with maybe hundreds, thousands of like good leaders, uh, really effective leaders who can get things done. Are there any patterns you've seen or characteristics or traits of people who've been really successful, good leaders uh, through your career and what you do right now? Well, one, I mean, you know, it's hard to not sound cliche with, with such a question like that because you really, you, you want to sound like, ah, I've got a thing that nobody's ever thought of before. No, no. But, Sometimes you just want to hear the simple but, truth. But like, you know, I think about one of the most irritating traits that Bill Gates had <laughs> That turned out to be something that I didn't appreciate at the time, but was actually really true. And, you know, Mark Andreessen for a long time had the Twitter bio, Strong Opinions Weekly Held. I would never say that Bill held an opinion weekly, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but it was strong opinion, willing to change. Yeah. And one of the things that I, I you know, that I definitely see are you know, leaders that really have a clear point of view about an abstract model about how things are evolving. Like, it's not just like, I have an opinion on this ad, or I have an opinion on this dialogue box, or this UI flow, or this onboarding. Like, anybody, like, I call that um, leading by editing. Like, anybody that works on in an industry can be shown something and criticize it. Mm -hmm. And it's super dangerous that that's the case because if you put a person that does that in a management position, they're a nightmare to work for. Mm -hmm. And and so I see that all, I have a, a blog post that I actually think is on Medium called uh, Leading is Not Editing. <laughs> and you just yeah. see that all the time. And to me, that was the old Windows team I described. Like two people showing up with competing visions of the future and you know, the person that they're presenting to didn't think up either of them. They're just there picking the best attributes of both and coming up with option three or declaring a winner and making one person want to quit and miserable. But not, none of those, no combination of those things is leading. Hmm. And so I think that the key thing, and it gets to why writing is so important, is that leading is giving people a picture upon which to decide things right. so that you aren't really the limiting factor, the gatekeeper, or the micromanager, or anything. And you have to have the fortitude as a leader to just let it go. Mm -hmm. And part of the benefit of creating a big picture is also knowing that sweating over every small detail sounds like an awesome management book about Steve Jobs, but it really isn't for you. It's right. not for me. It's not for you guys. Unless you're really, <laughs> really convinced you're Steve Jobs, Salving and addressing and sweating over every detail as though you thought it up is not a path to building a successful team. <laughs> and, and it's super hard. And because of everything I say, the reason I write a lot of words is because there's always two sides. Because then you could also be the manager that's like, oh, I don't know. Why don't you decide? I'm just the manager. And then nobody knows what to do. Yeah. Right. So yep. you have to have a way of finding your ability to have the conversation with the team that tells them in the framework I've laid out, this one sounds like a good idea, but with having them think that it was their idea, having them own <laughs> that it was their idea and leading them to conclude that it's the right thing to do and that they are accountable for doing it all without you not having your fingerprints on their decision. And that's really what leadership is. And <laughs> the best way to end is here, I'll give you a little mean thing. There's a very, very fine line between leadership and manipulation. <laughs> you have to figure that out to be a great leader. Man, this right. is, you said you didn't want to say something that would be like, oh, I figured this out kind of thing, but you kind of did. Like most people would be afraid to say something like this because being a leader sounds like yeah. this this word that is so full of gravitas. And But you're totally right. Like all these years in our careers, we've kind of somehow like realized, stumbled upon this to be the universal truth and like being an effective leader. Yeah. on uh, getting the team 
to make the decision, make the call without your fingerprints on it, but you want to make yeah. them make sure that they make the right decision. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you know, the way we said it in Windows when, when we got, came over and sort of populating the team was we really believe in empowerment. Like you are totally empowered to do your thing. It's just that we are not empowering you to do stupid things. Yeah. <laughs> and knowing the difference. That's where, uh, <laughs> knowing the difference, that's where lies the magic. Yeah. Uh, man, uh, this, this is fantastic. This was amazing. This is like yeah. a trip down memory lane. This is the canonical Steven Sinofsky episode. Yes, yes. This is, <laughs> this will like, you know. We should... I, I didn't even get to get through everything that I wrote. Like, and this is only half, it turns out. Oh my I, You actually printed go it, check out. it out. Although now I'm going to turn off payment and not let people subscribe anymore because I'm done. So I don't know what's going to happen. I'm in the new feature area of Substack. I highly, highly recommend Steven's Substack. I don't know if there's a way to pay for it, but it's on the interwebs. So go uh, Check find out hardcore it. Hardcore Software. Hardcore Software. And Steven's on Twitter, pushing the character limits every single day. Uh, and <laughs> uh, Steven, this was, this was so amazing. For Elon. Long tweets. Oh, yeah. Oh, this was amazing, Steven. Just all the stories, uh, your impact. So, so amazing. Thank you so, so much. This was such a blast. Well, thanks, guys. It was super fun. Thanks uh, so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, the Good Time Show by Arthi and Sriram.